Hello, I'm Eric Zimmer. Welcome back to the history of the British royal family. Where we last left off, the wit Queen Elizabeth took the throne, and we learned that her younger sister, Princess Margaret, got herself enroped in a scandal. And now we are about to find out in the last chapter of the history of the British royal family. To date, that is. You ready? All right, let's begin. Chapter 16, The Windsors, Part 2. A Modern Monarchy? <laughs> Princess Margaret was the live wire of the royal family. If she had not been born a princess, she could have had a brilliant career on the stage as a mimic, singer, or pianist. <laughs> She had charm, she had zest, she had personality. And, as Peter Townsend himself said, she was intensely beautiful. What Margaret did not have was luck. Margaret first met Peter Townsend in 1945, when she was only 15 years old. He had just become equerry to her father, King George VI. Townsend was handsome and charming. He was a war hero. Margaret fell deeply in love with Peter Townsend and set her heart on marrying him. Margaret was delighted when she found that Townsend loved her in return. But there were tremendous scandals. Townsend was divorced. The social barriers divorced people faced were bad enough. But the English church did not even recognize divorce. It was an impossible idea that the Queen's sister should marry a man whose first wife was still living and become stepmother to his children. <laughs> Even Wallace Simpson didn't have any children, nor did she have any with Edward. If they did, that would have jeopardized the line of succession. <laughs> the Queen, supreme head of the Church of England, could not possibly give permission for such a marriage. The only way it could go ahead was for Margaret to give up her royal title, to cut herself off from the, her family, and leave England to live abroad for the rest of her life. Queen Elizabeth II did not want that to happen to her beloved sister, so she tried another way. Peter Townsend was given a job in Belgium. It was only just across the English Channel, but far enough away for, to separate him from Margaret. The Queen hoped the love would cool. Here's a picture of them together, Margaret and Peter Townsend. That did not happen. When Townsend returned to England in 1955, the romance was still very much on. English newspapers went into a frenzy of speculation. Could the couple marry or not? Come on, Margaret, make up your mind, ran one newspaper headline. Ooh, I can't believe they actually said that. But Margaret was not in a position to make up her mind. She was bombarded with reasons not to marry Townsend. The church was against it. The royal family did not like it. The people were divided. Some thought that as a war hero, Townsend would make an admirable husband for the royal princess. Others believed that Margaret should put her royal duty first. Royal duty won in the end. The announcement came on October 31st, Halloween, 1955. Margaret had decided not to marry Peter Townsend. Mindful of the church's teaching that Christian marriage is indissoluble, and of my duty to the Queen, I have decided to put these considerations before all others. It was the worst moment in Mar of Margaret's life. She never got over it. She plunged into a frantic round of parties. She became the star of the fun luck Ving jet set. She went to nightclubs. She shocked everyone by drinking and smoking in public. She made friends with people royals were not supposed to mix with. Actors, actresses, and pop stars. Oh! And then in 1959, Townsend wrote to Margaret that he was going to marry a Belgian girl, Marie Lucy. No one was surprised that Marie Lucy looked almost exactly like Princess Margaret. Margaret, meanwhile, had received a proposal of marriage from the English Society photographer Anthony Armstrong Jones. 
Strong Jones. And he... I received the letter from Peter in the morning, she said later, and that evening I decided to marry Tony. I didn't really want to marry at all. Why did I? Because he asked me. In time, the reason proved not to be good enough. Margaret and Tony, as they became as they came to be known, were married at Westminster Abbey on May 6th, 1960. And here's a picture of them at their wedding. It was a splendid royal occasion. The couple later had two children. But the marriage was doomed. Armstrong Jones, who became Lord Snowden, came to hate his link with the royal family. It got in the way of his career. The couple had terrible rows. Each took lovers. And at last, in 1976, they decided to give up. Margaret and Tony separated, and in 1978 they were divorced. Margaret never married again. She drank and smoked even more than before. She took much younger men as lovers. She held high-life parties at her villa on the island of Mustique. At home in England, Margaret received occasional visits from Peter Townsend. But he died in 1995. At last it all caught up, caught up with her. Her health began to fail. She suffered a series of strokes. Outside her family and friends, outside her family and friends, no one knew how badly she was affected until August fourth, two thousand one, the day her mother, the Queen Mother, celebrated her one hundred and first birthday. <laughs> Look at her living the high life. Hmm. There was the Queen Mother, looking fit and sprightly, waving to crowds, cheering her outside her London home, Clarence House. And there was Princess Margaret, sitting in a wheelchair, half paralyzed and partially blind. Ugh. Princess Margaret died six months later, on February 9th, 2002, at the age of 71. By that time, the royal family had been rocked by another scandal even greater than the Townsend affair, and almost as serious as the abdication of King Edward VIII. It was a story of betrayal, bad faith, and hole-in-the-wall affairs. Once again, people wondered if the English monarchy would survive. And once again, they watched with a mixture of horror and fascination as the fearful story unfolded. And this is one that I think many of you are familiar with. In fact, I doubt if anybody doesn't know this story. <clears throat> this, though, was the last thing on anyone's mind on July 29th, 1981, when Prince Charles Philip Arthur George, heir to the throne to this day, married Lady Diana Spencer at St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And here they are at their wedding. The press pronounced it the fairy tale marriage of the century. The fresh faced, 20 year old Diana became an overnight star. Everywhere she went, she was greeted by huge crowds. She was the most famous, most photographed woman in the world. The public loved her. The press loved her. Everyone loved her. Except for her 33-year-old husband, Prince Charles. No one knew it at the time, but Charles was in love with someone else. Camilla Parker Bowles, who had once been his girlfriend. Charles could have married Camilla as far back as 1973, but he had thought she was not quite pure enough for a future Queen of England. She had had lovers. She was too much of a go-getter to settle down to the dull round of royal duties. So Charles let her go and Camilla married someone else. Even then, Camilla was not completely out of Charles's life. They remained friends and occasional lovers. Camilla boosted Charles's confidence, made him feel good, and accepted him as he was. Before long, Charles realized that by marrying Diana, he had married trouble. Lady Diana Spencer youngest daughter of the Earl of Spencer, was the child of a broken marriage. When she was only six years old, her mother, Frances, suddenly disappeared from home and never came back. The divorce that followed was so brutal that Frances would never speak about it. In a fight for custody of their four children, Earl Spencer won by blackening his wife's character. The effect on Diana and her younger brother, Charles, was devastating. Diana grew up insecure and longing for love. She wanted a husband who would be hers, and hers alone, who would love her and protect her, and always be there for her. But Charles could not give Diana the attention she craved. Being Prince of Wales, and the heir to the throne, was not a nine-to-five job. Charles had royal duties to perform and was often away from home. Moreover, Charles and Diana were very different people. Charles loved opera. Diana preferred pop music. 
Charles liked reading books about philosophy or history. Diana liked romantic novels. None of this would have ha mattered had there been good enough will between them. I mean, enough goodwill between them. But goodwill was difficult when Charles's friends thought Diana was an airhead. Her friends thought Charles was stuffy and dull. It did not take long for relations between Charles and Diana to become strained. Diana came to believe that if only she could get Charles away from Camilla, everything would be all right. But the more Diana nagged him to give up Camilla, the more Charles clung to Camilla. Diana staged dramatic tantrums. While she was expecting their first child, Prince William Arthur Philip Lewis, Diana threw herself downstairs to prevent Charles going out riding. Unfortunately, Charles was not the sort of strong-minded man to minded man to cope with a wife who behaved like this. Charles's solution was to run to Camilla, which only made matters worse. Royal duty demanded that in public, Charles and Diana must have put a brave face on the situation. Even so, there was plenty of media speculation that all was not well in the household of the Prince and Princes of Wales. It was easy to laugh off the talk as gossip, but in fact, the media were right. By 1986, Charles and Diana's marriage was come was crumbling fast. Charles later confessed by th that by that time, he was no longer sleeping with his wife. In 1987, Diana seemed to give up hope that Charles would ever give her the attention she wanted. She began to look for it elsewhere, with other men. In 1991 came the 10th anniversary of Charles and Diana's wedding. A day to celebrate? No, it was not. No one felt like celebrating. On their wedding anniversary, they were apart. Charles and London... Diana and Wales. The tenth anniversary party Queen Elizabeth II wanted to give for them never took place. Meanwhile, a time bomb was ticking that the burst of the that would burst the bubble of the so-called fairy tale marriage forever. Sometime in the winter of 1991 and 1992, Diana gave the royal reporter Andrew Morton long, detailed interviews about what was really going on in her marriage. She told him everything. No holds were barred. Morton's book, Diana, Her True Story, was published in London on June 7th, 1992. It was a bombshell. Morton painted a picture of Charles as cold and arrogant. He was supposedly jealous of Diana's success and popularity. Even worse was to come. The book revealed that Diana had attempted to commit suicide five times. She suffered from the eating disorder, bulimia. She had mutilated herself on several occasions. When Morton's book was published, there were de denials all around that Diana had anything had had anything to do with it. But who else would have known about the marriage in such detail? Hmm. Morton's fo fellow journalists and others with inside information guessed the truth, but the public was unaware for another five years until shortly after Diana's death. <clears throat> Public reaction to Diana, her true story, was extraordinary. Many readers were convinced it to told the truth. If Diana had taken lovers, which she had, Charles's behavior had driven her to it. Nothing seemed to be too bad to say about Prince Charles, who was now cast as public enemy number one. But even this was not the end of the scandals of 1992, which Queen Elizabeth II later described as her Annus Horribilis. Horrible year in Latin. On March 19th, the Queen's second son, Prince Andrew Albert Christian Edward, Duke of York, separated from his wife, Sarah Ferguson. They had married in 1986 and had two daughters, Beatrice and Eugenie. But the marriage soon degenerated into a terrible tale of neglect, irresponsibility, and adultery. And then on April 13th, the Queen's only daughter, Princess Anne, began a divorce action against her husband, Captain Mark Phillips. With that, the marriages of three of the Queen's four children, Edward was not married until 1999, her youngest child, were on the rocks. But the main spotlight was on Charles and Diana. Diana and her true story had been the end of the line. There could be no forgiveness. Prince Charles felt grossly betrayed. The Queen was angry at all the dirty linen Diana had washed in public. Charles' friends responded to Morton's book with a magazine article written by, journal by the journalist Penny Jenner. This told the Prince's story side of the story. 
It pictured Diana as paranoid and jealous. She had kept Prince William and Prince Harry away from their father. She swore at Charles and pulled every dirty trick known in the annals of shrewish wives. By this time, the media were daily reporting accusation and counter-accusation, claim and counter-claim. No one knew any longer who was telling... No one knew any longer who was telling the truth and who was lying. Scandalous revelations came thick and fast. Smutty conversations on secret tapes involving both Charles and Diana were tran transcribed and published. The headlines were lurid. My life of torture. Love tapes upset Diana. And worse. After all this, it was impossible for the fairy tale marriage to go on. The end came near all the close of... 1992. On December 9th, Charles and Diana's separation was announced in the House of Commons by Prime Minister John Major. The divorce followed nearly four years later, on August 28th, 1996. Now that Diana was no longer royal, she lost her title of Her Royal Highness, and no one had to courtesy to her anymore. But she was still a headline maker and was going to make more sensational news after July of 1997, when she received an invitation from the Egyptian billionaire Mohammed al Faid owner of Harrods, the luxury London store. Al Faid offered Diana and her two boys his villa at St. Tropez, complete with his yacht, Johnny Cal, and a companion, his handsome and personable son, Dodie. No sooner had Dodie and Diana got together in St. Tropez than the press was weaving a romance about them. Sensing a major story, boatloads of newsmen and photographers descended at St. Tropez. Uh-oh, I know what's coming next. Dodie and Diana fled, first to the Mediterranean island of Corsica, then to Sardinia, and finally on August 30th, to Paris. But word of their arrival had gone ahead of them, and the paparazzi, who made a living talking and selling photographs of celebrities, were waiting for them. Dodie and Diana were the greatest celebrities the paparazzi had encountered at the time, in a long time. A group of them followed the couple to their Paris hotel, and then laid siege to it. The couple managed to escape by a back entrance, but the paparazzi were soon on their tail. It was nearly midnight. Doty ordered his driver, Henry Paul, to step on it, and a high-speed chase began through the streets of Paris. As Henry Paul reached an underpass close to the Place d'Alma, his Mercedes was doing close to 135 miles an hour. The Mercedes shot into the underpass. Soon Henry Paul, who, according to reports, was drunk, lost control of the car. It skidded across the tunnel, crashed into a pillar, bounced off and hit the opposite wall. The car ended up in a tangle of twisted metal and broken glass. Dodie was killed at, at once. So was Henry Paul. Diana lived through the crash, but her injuries were too severe for her to survive. She pronou was pronounced dead at the hospital at four o'clock in the, mor the next morning. Um, she was 36. Only 36 years old. When the news reached Britain, people went into shock. They stood in the streets, tears pouring down their cheeks. Thousands descended on London and laid so many flowers for remembrance outside the royal palaces that the sidewalks disappeared under a thick carpet of blooms. Many of the mourners stood in line for hours to sign books of condolence. There was open criticism of the cold-hearted queen and her family, who were spending their regular holiday at Balmoro in Scotland, and were still there instead of heading immediately for the capital. Eventually, the royals gave in. They returned to London, and the Queen gave a short tribute to Diana on television. For her pains, rem members of the public pronounced her speech not emotional enough. Huh. Diana's funeral took place on September 6th. London virtually closed down for the day. Huge crowds lined the streets as Diana's coffin was driven to Westminster Abbey for a short service. They were still there when the cortege made its way out of London, heading for Northamptonshire and Diana's childhood home, Althorpe House. There, in a private family ceremony, she was buried on an island in the middle of the lake. Goodbye, England's Rose, said the next day's headlines as newspapers were filled page after page with reports of one of the most emotional, most tearful days England had ever seen. But this was by no means the end of the Diana story. The intrusive, gossip-hungry media soon saw to that. Charles and his long-time love, Camilla Parker Bowles, were still around and therefore still 
acceptable to uh, reports that Diana's army of fans had never and would never forgive the prince for the way he had treated his wife. Even six years after Diana's death, millions were still willing to feed on any news that painted the prince as a villain. In January of 2004, for example, the newspaper reported, a newspaper report about a letter purportedly written by Diana. In this, she stated that Charles was planning a car accident in which she would suffer a serious head injury. The letter was rev later revealed as a crude forgery, but not before it convinced millions that Charles was a potential murderer. The public were regularly polled for their opinions, and these showed that a majority rejected Charles as the future king. They preferred his eldest son, William, as it, heir to the throne instead. Over seven years after Diana's death, when Charles was la at last married at last married Camilla Parker Bowles on April 9, 2005. The numbers who wanted William for king had dropped, but still stood at 42%, 8% higher than in 2001. Diana's continuing influence was evident from the moment Charles and Camilla became engaged on February 10, 2005. It was announced that instead of being called Princess of Wales after the marriage, Camilla would take her future title, Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cornwall, from Charles's estate, the Duchy of Cornwall. She would not be queen when he became king, but princess consort. These efforts were to avoid comparisons with Diana, did not prevent the late princess's fans from sending hundreds of pieces of hate mail to Camilla before the wedding. It was feared that on the day that there might be demonstrations against the newlyweds outside the registry office in Windsor, Berkshire, where the ceremony was performed. Consequently, Charles and Camilla bypassed the crowd of spectators waiting to greet them, and drove off as soon as the ceremony was over. Charles and Diana were by no means the only avenue go through which the media kept the Diana story going. In 2002, for example, there was the sensational trial of Diana's butler, Paul Burrell, who was accused of stealing items belonging to Diana, Charles, and their two sons. The trial was stopped and Bro acquitted after the Queen recalled a conversation which the butler told her he was keeping safe the items he was later charged with appropriating. Rumors soon flourished that the Burrell trial had come too close to revealing evidence that might have embarrassed Her Majesty. Hmm. Harold Brown, another royal butler whose trial was on similar charges had also was also halted, refused to sell his story to the press. Paul Burrow had no such qualms. He became a headline celebrity with fresh revelations of royal misbehavior. According to Burrow, Diana's erstwhile father-in-law, Prince Philip, wrote her insulting letters, calling her a harlot and a trollop. Philip, backed up by Rosa Monckton, Diana's close friend, hotly denied these allegations. The year 2002 also produced one of the most tight titillating of Diana's stories. James Hewitt, one of her ten alleged lovers, was known to the tabloid press as a love rat for going public about her, their affair. A former major in the cavalry regiment of the British Army, Hewitt was forced to resign over, these, over the revelations. In 1998, Hewitt announced that he would never sell the 64 love letters Diana had written him, but four years later, he was asking a massive 10 million pounds for them. Whoa. The price included some salacious tibbets, including the nicknames Diana gave to their private parts and details of the sex toys she sent him while he was serving in Kuwait during the First Gulf War in 1991. Although Hugh had received offers, they fell sh far short on his asking price. The highest bid reached only £4 million. Also in 2002, a rumour circulated that Hewitt, not Prince Charles, was the father of Diana's second son, Prince Harry. There was certainly a resemblance between Hewitt and Harry, who was born on September 15, 1984. They had the same neat facial features, and both of them had red hair. In September 2002, Hewitt publicly denied the rumours. Then news came to light that in 1985, the royal family had ordered a DNA test to prove paternity. Diana, it was said, was incensed, but the test proved that, after all, Prince Charles, not Hewitt, was Harry's father. By this time, Har Prince Harry was 18, old enough for some hell-raising of his own. Harry gave the press plenty of material. He indulged in drinking while below, still below the legal age. He smoked pot. 
he scuffled with a photographer outside a nightclub. But none of these compared with the furor that ensued in January 2005 when Harry was pictured at a fancy dress party wearing a World War II Jeremy Army uniform complete with an armband bearing the Nazi swastika. Harry was savaged in the press for his insensitivity regarding the Holocaust and for insulting the memory of his great-grandparents, King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who had been symbols of British defiance of the Nazis during World War II. Harry apologized, but the criticisms continued. A furious Prince Charles ordered him to visit Auschwitz-Birkenau, the largest of the Nazi concentration camps. In July of 2006, stories emerged about Harry's infidelity towards his long-term girlfriend, Chelsea Davy. This time, the tabloid newspaper, The Sun, reported that Chelsea was putting a brave face on the news that the prince had enjoyed a wild night out a party, at a party at the art bar in London where he romanced an older woman, Catherine Davis, a 34-year-old mother of two. To make matters worse, this was apparently the fourth time her boyfriend had seduced another woman, leaving Chelsea furious. It was June 2000. 2010, before another British newspaper, the News of the World, reported that 